We have very unique transportation modes to transport the gift boxes to the children. We have canoes, we have what we call a donkey car, and we also have trucks. And then we have humans that are carrying the gift boxes to different places. My name is Grace. I'm the logistics coordinator for Operation Christmas Child Namibia. I am responsible for ensuring that the gift boxes get into the country and into the hands of the children. When the gift boxes arrived at the port, inspection is done by the customs officials. We always prepare prayerfully so that the hearts of the customs officials are kind and soft towards the projects. Once the customs officials clear the gift boxes, then the gift boxes get to be released. Once the gift boxes are released, we load them onto the trucks. The trucks transport the gift boxes to the different regions. The regional teams receive the gift boxes and that's how the ministry partners receive the gift boxes and then they get to distribute the gift boxes to the children. So this whole process involves a lot of volunteers and it involves a lot of dedication. Our prayer request is for the safety of everybody that is involved in transporting the gift boxes, for God to bless them and for them not to give up helping us in this process. Oper Operation Christmas Child is a great ministry. Yeah, I feel like I'm not on. But uh, if you don't take an opportunity to pack a shoebox, guys, you're missing the opportunity that God really wants you to uh, be a part of. Give me some more sound. All right. Hey, I know I can be heard. Okay, but if you don't miss, you're missing a great opportunity if you don't pack a shoebox. God takes these little trinkets and he showers them with his love because they hear the gospel and they change hearts all around this world. That's what Christmas is all about. God came to give us the greatest gift ever, and that's Jesus. And through these Operation Christmas Child boxes, Jesus gets spread and Jesus gets to uh, be put front and center. And usually from every one of these boxes, they say like seven people in the family accept Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. I can't tell you, but man, that's something I want to be involved in so bad. And I pack more and more boxes. My wife keeps telling me, hey, how many boxes are we doing this year? But it gets me fired up because these boxes do change lives. And I'm not able to go to all these other foreign places, but these boxes are, and man, we even take a trip down to Atlanta to pack these things, and God uses these things in a mighty, mighty way. So don't miss your opportunity to have a blessing this Christmas season and pack a couple of boxes. If you want to get me something for Christmas, pack a box and just tell me you packed a box, okay? That'd be awesome because, man, I know that gift's going to keep going and going and going because it's going to change other lives, okay? So if you don't have an opportunity, the boxes are out there. Grab one. There's a shopping list. You can do it online. There's a lot of ways that you can pack a shoebox, but don't forget to do one. You need to have it done before uh, November 21st and uh, have it here. And we're a distribution place where you drop it off. And we'll get it sent on to the packing places. So please do a shoebox. That's my plea for you. Another thing, your church has been working hard this week. Uh, man, it's been a great week to be at Dorsville. Uh, we've had the lights on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And uh, we've had 827 people go through Judgment House this year. So, man, praise the Lord for that. Get this, God allowed us to see nine new souls saved for the heaven. That's pretty awesome. We've had 15 rededications this week, so that's pretty awesome. One other thing is your church. Your church is growing. Man, through this whole thing, guys, I don't know if you know it, but these kids down front, these people in play in heaven, these leaders that lead this thing, 
God does a work in our hearts this week, too. And it's been glad to be a part of this hard week, but this great week to spend it with God and see how he showed up in mighty ways. Tonight, we're going to uh, take some time in the youth group to kind of go through Judgment House, unpack it a little bit. But I want to tell you, these youth stepped it up, man. I really am proud of them. Stand up, guys. Anybody that had a part in Judgment House this year, stand up. If you prayed, if you were a cast member, you cooked, if you were in counseling. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Without you all being plugged in, man, it wouldn't happen. And God shows up in mighty ways. Let me tell you what somebody told me that went through this. They go, we were over in Missouri, and we went through Judgment House over around St. Louis. And they went through Judgment House, and they go, man, it's nothing like yours. You guys take a great deal of care in presenting the gospel, a great deal of care in the way you present this thing. And they said, man, that really impacted me, the way you guys took the time to make this thing special. And that's the way it's been the last 23 years we've done this. Even when we had to do it online, it's been a great deal of care, a great deal of love, and a great deal of prayer. I was so excited when Trey told me that, that he had a prayer service and you guys almost had 100 people show up to pray for Judgment House before it even happened. That's what we're reaping, guys. The Holy Spirit shows up and does great things. And guys, uh, we couldn't do it without this young man right here. Yeah, Trey. Oh, yeah. Hey, Daddy. Yeah. 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 This guy puts his heart and soul in what he does around here. And it showed in Judgment House, and I know it shows because you guys are standing up giving my ovation, but man, the gates of heaven won't be the same one day because this guy's put his heart and soul in this project, and he's doing a great job, and he's going to have it out there online. We're going to be able to see it on YouTube, right? Right. All right, and you get to watch it again. But the last two years we've done it online, I think we've had 9,000 people view our first one, and 6,000 view the second one. But keep passing the word. It's on YouTube, and God's going to keep using those things, and we'll get this one this year's out there on YouTube too. But thank you, Trey, and your heart and what God's doing in your life. Amen. Whew. Man, I'll tell you what, man. Church, we got a bright future. We just need to stay focused on the Lord, stay focused on him, and he's going to direct us. We got a thing. We're going to thank our veterans today. So if you'll watch this veteran thing. There is a call. Some hear it like a distant thunder. Some hear it like a whisper in the ear. Some just feel it in their hearts. A deep sense of responsibility to country, to service, to something bigger than themselves. We honor those who are willing to do what so few have done. Because of their sacrifice and service, our country is a light on the hill that cannot be put out. Though many have tried, those who stand and protect it are heroes, worthy of our respect and admiration, worthy of every minute of attention we give to pause and recognize the hope, the sacrifice, the honor of all who have served our country. This coming Friday, of course, is Veterans Day, November the 11th. And uh, I hope you'll take the time and look for opportunities um, to thank the men and women that you see out and around in your world and thank them for their service. You know, there's a time when Veterans Day was a non-holiday uh, and it was just kind of flat. And then after Desert Storm and, and all that 1990s, the heroes came home. And we, those, those of us who are older, got the benefit of seeing Veterans Day revived. And we're so grateful for that. So, so be sure and tell the ones that you know thank you. And that's, by the way, that's why we do this. You, 
You know, some churches have stopped honoring veterans on Veterans Day. The reason we do it is because the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse number 18, give thanks in everything. And we need to tell our veterans thank you. We need to thank God that we live in America where we can sing songs of praise and no one's going to walk through that door and arrest us. I can stand up and preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and no one's going to come in and arrest me. And all that is made possible by the ones who have sacrificed and given their lives and served their country over the years. So it's with an honor that we honor our Veterans Day. So if you are a veteran today, would you please stand to your feet, please? All our veterans, would you please stand? There we go. Give these guys a round of applause. There you go. Amen, amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And by the way, guys is a neutral term. We have a young lady here serving also. My daughter, by the way, followed her daddy's footprints and served um, in the Air Force. And so I am proud of her. So anyway, so what we'd like to do now, um, you know, through the years that we've done this, we've honored our World War II vets and our Korean vets, um, Vietnam vets, and then all the ones, the Desert Storm and all of those that served that way. And so this year, we got the idea about what if we honored the five most senior veterans um, that we have. And so we wanted to give them a special gift, and so we ordered something for them. And um, we have three of them here today, and um, one, Whitey McLean, um, slipped into heaven before we could present his blanket to him, his throw to him. It's a throw with an eagle and American flag on it. And uh, Don, uh, Dale and Monterey Palmer went up north, drove four hours north uh, to go to his funeral, and they presented Gene uh, with his gift. I thought that was very, very, very special. And then it was my privilege. Um, Paul Emery is one of our Korean veterans, and uh, he is no longer able to come. And it's my privilege to deliver his to him on Tuesday at his home. And he was so very appreciative of that. But we have three of our, our five most senior guys here today. And I'm not going to try to guess the age, uh, put them in order in any way. But I will know this. You know, we are privileged to still have a World War II veteran with us. And, and we are very grateful uh, for John Parker. John, where are you at, buddy? Right back there. There he is. Give him a round of applause. Amen. Thank you so much. Amen. Amen, amen. So another one of our most senior is sitting right over here, Brother Bill Clayton sitting there with Laverne. And um, we have, a, again, a gift for him. And Bill, we honor you and thank you, sir, for your service to the country. Amen. Thank you, Father. Amen, amen. Very good. All right, and our last one uh, of our, our most seniors is George Teagarden. And George's sitting right back there. There he is. George, you please stand. Let's give George a round of applause. Thank you, man. Very good. Amen. Why don't you stay standing? Let me lead us in prayer. Father, we are so grateful for our country. And Father, we of all people know, as Americans we know, uh, Father, we've got a lot of warts, we've got a lot of problems. But I want to say thank you for this country where we can still worship and still preach the word of God. Thank you for all the freedoms that we have that were made possible by those who many laid their life down and so many, many have served. So we are grateful and thankful for all of that. And Father, we do pray for our country. Uh, we pray, Father, that we'll find our way back, Father, to you. And, Lord, that's our job is to get that message out, that you love people, and, Jesus, you died for people. And, again, in so many countries, that would be against the law, but not here in America, and we're thankful for that. Now, bless our time of worship. Bless these veterans, especially these special five. And, Jesus, I pray it in your precious name. And all God's people said, amen. 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 Just remain standing.
Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the holy with holy thunder? Who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. Now you would bear my cross. You laid down your life that I would be set free. Oh, oh, oh Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Who breaks the pounds back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory. Who rules the nations with truth and justice? Shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is a family love. Now you would take my place. Now you would bear my cross. You laid down your life that I would be set free. I see for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place that you would bear my cross you laid down your life that I would be set free oh Jesus I sing all that you've done for me Then through the darkness 
your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written Jesus Christ my living and who could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace the God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame the cross has spoken I am forgiven the king of kings calls me his own beautiful savior I'm yours forever Jesus Christ my living hope hallelujah praise the one who set me free hallelujah death has lost its grip on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name jesus christ my living its grip on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name jesus christ my living hope then came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the same on me sing that again then came the morning that sealed the promise your very body began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on jesus yours is the victory hallelujah praise the one who set me Drip on me, you have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. God, you are my living. as we pray. 
Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for this week um, and all the people who have passed through this church, through Judgment House, and all the many people who came together to put it on. We just ask that you continue to be blessing those hearts who came through, even the ones who maybe didn't make a decision um, during this week, but who you're working in their lives. And as we talked about in Sunday School, be with all the lives of the people who were in Judgment House, because we have no doubt that Satan, if they didn't attack him last week or this week, he might be working on it soon for all the work that they did for you, Lord, over the past week. So we just ask that in your name, and we ask you to bless this offering that we take before us. Amen. Amen. me the kindness of mercy that bought with blood wholeheartedly my soul undeserving God you're so
We are glad that you are here, and you know what? This is a wonderful crowd, especially for Time Change Weekend. Thank you for coming, and when you leave today, our hope and prayer is, is that you get something you can take home and use during the week, something that will bless and be able to apply to your life. Well, two headlines. Number one is, God, you are so good. Isn't that a wonderful song? God, a blending of an old, old chorus with some new words. 
God is so good. If you need to write that down, do that. If your life is difficult right now, and you need to write that down, go ahead and do that. If you need to go to the tattoo parlor and maybe get it on your hand somewhere, go ahead and do that because we need to remember that, God, you are so good. Number two, second headline is, we've got so much to be thankful for. Thank you, Bing Crosby, for the song. Love it. God, we've got plenty to be thankful for. And we may not have all the fancy things in life, but guess what? We got Jesus. And shoot, Jesus is enough. That's all that really matters. Now, we're going to spend the entire month talking about uh, gratitude. You know, we, if, if you'll think back just a little bit, you know, we, in that series, we talked about greed, and that was, kind of the, uh, that was kind of difficult, okay? But then we talked about generosity, and we saw that so played out this week in Judgment House because generosity, remember, has nothing to do with the amount of money. It has to do with our attitude. And what I saw this week was so many great attitudes as people gave themselves away, gave their time away. It's been said that time is your most precious commodity because you only get 144 minutes a day, uh, 1,440 minutes a day. And so, hey, it's all you got. And when you share that, you're sharing a great and wonderful gift. And then we're going to talk this whole month now about how can we be thankful. And the key is the more thankful we are, the more we express gratitude, the happier we are going to be. Our sermon title, is crazy gratitude and no that is not a time change mistake it's upside down because it's crazy crazy gratitude and we're going crazy over being thankful for all that God has given us and done for us sermon title of course is be the one be the one did you know did you know that it's been said no it's not said it's a fact Newman said it was a fact, okay? Did you know that 10% of the people in any given church, Baptist, Methodist, doesn't matter, whatever denomination, doesn't matter, 10% of the people give 90% of the offerings? Isn't that amazing? Be the one. Be the one. Did you know that 10% of the people do 90% of the work in any given church? Yeah, it's just true. Be the one. And those may be challenging for us, but this is a no-brainer. We can all be the one that gives thanks back to God. Our scripture is found in Luke chapter 17. It's a very familiar story, but last night of all time, actually, I snuck away before the first group came through. I snuck over to my office and was studying for this morning, trying to get that thing in my head, and I, I ran across verse number 10 of Luke chapter 17, and I said, oh, we need to talk about this. It's one of those verses that you kind of go, what? It's a little, a little bit more difficult, and Luke chapter 17 and verse number 10, look at this thing. Now, now this is Jesus talking. This isn't Paul or Peter on a rant. This is Jesus. And look what he says. In the same way, when you have done all that you were commanded, so you do all this stuff, you know, all that God asks you to do, you do all of that, you should say, we are unworthy servants. We've only done our duty. Wow. And you know why? It's because of this. When you, think, when you think about, you know, God, you know, sending Jesus to the earth and we have Christmas and then he lives a sinless life and then they, they crucify him on a Roman cross and then we have Easter and he resurrects on the third day. When you have all of that, okay, and, and then he says, okay, anyone who believes in Jesus, okay, and turns from their sin can have this incredible gift called eternal life. What other response can we have? Can we work enough hours? Can we give ourselves away enough to where we somehow you know, earn that? No. We, Jesus said, listen, just say, we are unworthy servants. We've only done our duty. Wow, what a verse. Don't hear that one preached too often. And like I said, I, I jump back up to get that. And here's a, here's a fun fact. You know a fun fact? In between, see, this is something we don't pick up on. In between this verse... In the same way, when you have done all that you were commanded, you should say we're unworthy servants building our duty. In between that and verse number 11, which we're going to talk about in just a moment, you know what happens? All of John chapter 11. The whole thing. In between the time he says this, and then he says what Luke says, what he says about Jesus next, we have all of John chapter 11. And you might be going, well, what in the world is John chapter 11? It is the death and resurrection of Lazarus. 
So tucked away between these two verses in Luke, all of the great story about Lazarus. And he orders Lazarus come out and Lazarus comes back to life. And Mary and Martha, all of that occurs tucked in the middle. And so often, some of the best and greatest truths are tucked away in the most special places in the Bible. So, so when we think about that verse, it helps us understand the next verse. Look at verse number 11. As, as Jesus continued on toward Jerusalem, he reached the border between Galilee and Samaria. Now, I want you to zone in on as Jesus continued on toward Jerusalem. It's so amazing. You know, we know the Bible says that Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. He, he came to find the broken people of the world, which, by the way, is all of us. I, I shared so many times this week in Judgment House how that all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. And so, so he continued on toward Jerusalem for the sole purpose of seeking and saving that which was lost. Do you know what I love about Jesus? You know, Jesus was able to focus, to zoom in on the mission. And what was the mission? It was this. You ever want to know, well, why did Jesus come to earth? It was this. You know, you know why did Jesus you know, live a sinless life? It was this. It was the cross. He came you know, on Christmas again to, to, to die for our sins. That's the whole reason why he came. And yet, and yet, he never lost the purpose. Yes, he's going to Jerusalem, but even on his path to Jerusalem, he wasn't too busy to see people. He always focused, now listen, listen, he always focused on the mission, but he never lost track of the object of his mission. And the object of his mission was people. You know, churches can get really busy doing a lot of stuff, have a lot of great programs, but we must never lose track of two things, Jesus and people. Jesus and people. It doesn't matter we got the finest worship, the biggest programs, the nicest building. None of that matters if we lose track of Jesus and people. Love God, love people. Love God, love people. Love God, love people. And Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. And notice this. He passes through this mission field. He, he reaches the border between Galilee and Samaria. Galilee was the poor side of town. Galilee was the wrong side of the tracks. And it isn't crazy. There are two things you knew about Galilee. Number one, they were poor. Jesus, are you ready? Jesus didn't even make middle class. Jesus was lower class. A lot of Galileans were lower class. And where did Jesus spend most of his ministry time? In Galilee. When Jesus wanted to choose his apostles, his disciples, who did he pick? Galileans. So it's so amazing. He saw this incredible mission field. Do you remember when we built this building and we had to make this decision? Brent, do you remember this? And we talked about moving. Remember, we said, well, should we go buy land somewhere and build a whole new complex? And we determined, no, this is where God put us. It's not the fanciest part of town, but it is our mission field. And that's why Dorsville sits where it sits. Amen. He served Galileans. Amen. But watch this. He also served Samaritans. Samaritans were the enemy of the Jews, and the Jews were enemies of Samaritans. Um, they were, they were half-breeds. Um, they were victims. The Samaritans were victims of racism. They, they were victims of prejudice. To every Jew, a Samaritan was a dog. To every, to every Jew, a Samaritan was a half-breed. Not worthy. Unworthy. And yet when Jesus takes his journey, yep, Goes right through Samaria. See, he he saw he saw Samaria not as an area to avoid, but as an area to embrace. He he didn't see a place you know to where it was opposition. He saw it as a place of opportunity. So our teaching point says this. Our teaching point says that. There we go. No, there we go. Thank you. I missed one. You know, Jesus pressed on because that was why he came. 
He came to seek and to save that which was lost. Luke chapter 9, verse 51. When the days were coming. Now remember, this is six, eight chapters before Luke chapter 17. Even as early as that, when the days were coming to a close for him to be taken up, he determined to go to Jerusalem. And if that involved uh, Jerusalem, if that involved Samaria, if that involved Gal- Galilee, it did not simply matter. That was why he came. So let's look at his destination and his course. Because it's very important. Our teaching point there, Eli. There we go. His destination and chosen path all speak of his character and his purpose. His destiny was where? His destination was the cross. Okay? And spoke of his purpose. But notice his chosen path. That speaks of his character. You know, one of my favorite verses is, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And he, God, delights in that path. And again, knowing that Jesus came for the express purpose to die for the sins of people, that was his chosen path. Did you catch that in the song? That sometimes sometimes the journey, sometimes the path that God gives us is difficult. Sometimes it involves suffering. It's too bad in America that we've been taught that if you get Jesus, everything is pecan pie with ice cream. And it's not. You know, you know, he chose, you know, God, Jesus chose 12 guys. One of them betrayed him. One of them, you know, turned his back on him. Okay. That left 11. Of that 11, one of them, John, was exiled to Patmos and lived to be about 90 years old in isolation. But the, you know, the other ones, the other 10, all martyred. There was no rock star. There was no perfect life. There was no, no, woohoo. There was death. There was suffering. And there was pain. Listen to this verse. In in Isaiah 53.10, this is the prophetic looking forward to Jesus chapter. Yet it pleased... Hey, guys. Hey, guys. Uh, Time stop. I'm talking. You're not. Okay? Yet it pleased the Lord to crush him severely. It pleased the Lord to crush him severely. Imagine that path, you know, that God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to the earth to be crushed severely. And that's what it was. And that's what it was. So the Bible says that as he's traveling, in verse number 12 and 13, as he entered a village there, ten men with leprosy stood at a distance. As he gets to the, as he gets to the border and between Galilee and between Samaria, there, there are ten guys, and they're standing at a distance, and they have leprosy. And you need to understand with leprosy, that was a walking death sentence. You were going to die. If you had leprosy, you were going to die. It was just a matter of time. But worse than that, you were isolated. By law, everywhere you went, you had to declare, unclean, unclean. No family, no community, no church, nothing. And he sees these 10 people with leprosy. Can I ask you a question? Who's your 10? Who's your 10? Who do you have in your life? Who do you have in your world that stands at a distance from from God, that stands at a distance from from culture, that stands at a difference from community, that stands at a a distance from church? Who is it? Is it the single mom down the road with two kids who, like I said, I think last week, who does does not know where Thanksgiving is coming from or Christmas is coming from? Is it the guy down the road that that his yard looks like a junkyard and you're angry at him because his property values are hurting your property values? Is it somebody you know that's like Jamal was, addicted to drugs or alcohol? Is it someone struggling with their gender identity? Is it someone from the other party, whatever party that is? Who are the ten people in your life? That they stand from a distance, they stand from a distance because they've been isolated. And here's the great part. I love this. It's because, you know, with God, he wants to end the isolation. He wants, he wants these people to come home. So, so they, they're standing there at a distance and they begin to cry out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on me. Jesus. 
Our teaching point says it. Jesus means God saves. Literally, from, from, the, from the Greek, it means Jehovah is salvation. Jehovah is salvation. So, so somehow they had heard. We don't know how. Uh, there was no internet. There was no Facebook. Uh, there was no newspaper. There was no new magazines. But word got around. And that this guy could heal leprosy. This guy could kill or heal the walking dead. Jesus. Jehovah is salvation. God. Master. Peter uses this word. And it means uh, commander. Commander. He, he, they knew this was the guy who could command leprosy. This is the man who could command leprosy to be healed, and it could be healed. And they cry out for mercy, unmerited love. Ten walking dead cry out to the giver of life. It was a cry of desperation. And a faith. Desperation and faith. Jesus was their only hope. Now look at me. Jesus is our only hope. Jesus is our only hope. Man, I know we are so frustrated with our country. And, and by the way, Tuesday is election day. I'm not telling you how to vote. You need to vote because it's your civic duty to do that. But let me just tell you something. The hope of America is not in a political party. The, the hope of America is not in a man. The hope of America is in a Savior, and His name is Jesus Christ. His, listen, His name is Jesus Christ. When I stood before those groups and these other presenters did, we made sure they understood something, that church couldn't do anything about the problem. That religion couldn't do anything about the problem. What does something about the problem is the answer and the answer is Jesus Christ. How powerful. Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. The only hope was Jesus. And folks, look at me. The only hope today is Jesus. Over in John chapter 6, there's a time when Jesus taught some really hard truth. And, and the Bible says a whole lot of people left him. And so he looks at the guys and says, hey, are y'all going to leave too? And Peter said, where are we going to go? You alone have the words of life. And church, we got to make sure we stay focused on Jesus because where else are we going to go? And we got to make sure that's the message we get out to the ones that are separated out there. That their only hope, it's not religion, it's not church, it's Jesus Christ. You know, uh, Sinclair Ferguson said this. He said, it's not your life and your past that determine your life. Now, let me, let me put a little twist on that for you that might help it make even more sense. You know, it is not, it is not your present and it's not your past that determine your future. It's not your present, it's not your past that determines your future. And then he says this, it is Christ's life and his past that determine your future. Have you ever thought about this? Jesus Christ is the only guy who lived 2,000 years ago that has a present. Isn't that cool? He's the only guy 2,000 years ago that's still alive today, still impacting the lives of people. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. And forever. And he can impact our, our present. He can impact our past. And he can impact our future. And so in verse number 14, the Bible says, he looked. He looked at them. I love this. I love this. For so many people, these ten men were invisible. For so many people... These men didn't even exist. They could holler or what they wanted to do. They didn't even see them. But to Jesus, every man and woman and child is visible. He sees, he sees what we don't see. He always sees the socially invisible. In our world, it's the homeless. In our world, it's the broken. In our world, it's the addicts. In our world, again, it's the ones struggling with, with gender. 
and a thousand other cultural issues that we have that we want simply for them to become invisible so we don't have to deal with them. But I'm here to tell you, Jesus Christ dealt with them in love. And if we're going to be Jesus followers, we have no choice but to do the same. I had a young person struggling with gender identity in one of my groups. He was a she. We talked a little bit afterwards, and I followed her down the hallway, and I said, I want you to know something. I said, do you have a church? She said, no. I said, I want to invite you to come here. And there's a friend that was with her, and I said, do you have a home, church home? No. I want to invite you to come here. And there was another guy who, who obviously was just struggling I mean, in, in darkness and black, and, you know, dressed in the dark. I said, dude, do you have a church home? No? Oh, I want to invite you to come here. Brothers and sisters, we cannot, should not, will not ignore the invisible because God didn't, Jesus didn't, and we simply cannot. Amen. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. And we are the one who associates degrees of lostness. What did I say at the beginning? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So he looks. And then he says to them, go show yourselves to the priest. Now, when you're a leper, there's only one reason to go see the priest. I mean, if you had leprosy, the priest didn't want to see you. In fact, the whole church didn't want to see you. So there's only one reason why he would tell them, go show yourselves to the priest. And that was, he was going to heal them. The problem is, he didn't say that. He didn't say, hi, okay, yeah, hey, I see you guys over there. Uh, listen, I'm going to cure you. So that, that was declare it. You're cured. Now go see the priest. Nothing. There's no evidence. Their circumstances didn't change. Nothing. All Jesus said was, go show yourself to the priest. They had to make a decision. They had to decide. Are we going to believe this guy? Because apparently, if we're going to see the priest, the only reason we go to the priest is if we were healed. So, so do we believe this guy or do we like, mm, I don't think so. The Bible says that as they went, when they made that crucial, when they, reached, when they reached critical mass and they determined that regardless of the fact there was no evidence, there wasn't really a command that, that they were healed, in spite of that, they chose to follow Jesus' command, and go see the priest. Here's something worth writing down. You need to remember, remember that clarity with God, clarity often comes after obedience. I, I know, I know. Here's what we want. God, you make it really, really clear to me, and then I'll obey you. You make it really clear, and then I'll obey you. That's how God works a lot. He just simply says this, if you want clarity, obey me. So these guys chose to step out and believe, okay, and they, and they go to see the priest, and as they went, the miracle happens. The Bible says, as they went, they were cleansed of their leprosy. So what's our teaching point? Our teaching point is this, Jesus saw them as they were. Listen, listen. We cannot wait for the world to get better. We've got to love them as they are. Come on now. Don't get quiet on me. We've got to, Jesus saw these men as they were. We've got to see the world as they are. And then he looked at them in love. He looked at them in love and then spoke the words of hope. Go show yourself to the priests. You know, Jesus did this looking at them in love thing a whole lot. Do you remember the dude, the rich guy who came to Jesus and said, hey, what do I need to do to, to have eternal life? And Jesus said, well, you know, what do the commands say? And da 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 and he, and he goes, I've, I've done all that already, Jesus. What else you got? It wasn't true. You know, Jesus could have said, liar, liar, pants on fire. But he didn't. You know what the Bible says it says? Yeah. Looking at him... 
Jesus loved him. Looking at him, Jesus loved him. Oh, what about the woman taking adultery? They drag her down there, out, you know, out of bed, committing adultery. You know, hey, Jesus, Moses says we should stone this woman. What do you say? You know, he said, okay, well, first person without sin cast the first stone. Slowly they all walked away. And then Jesus looks at her and says, where are, your con- you know, where are those who accused you? And there aren't anybody. Okay, I don't, I don't condemn you either. Hashtag, I love you. Now go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. How about the woman at the well? You answer for water, and, and so, so he's talking with her. So finally he goes, um, so why don't you go get your husband? <laughs> and she goes, don't have one. And Jesus said, you're right. He spoke truth. He said, you're right. You don't have a husband. In fact, you've had four others, and this guy's not your husband. You're just living with him. Why would Jesus do that? Because he loved her enough to speak the truth. See, church, listen. We, we, listen, we can love people and speak the truth. It's hard, but we've got to do that. We've got to be willing to speak truth. We can't compromise. But we can love and not compromise. The last one was, was the guy that, uh, <laughs> you know, the sheep thing, he, he, they, they land on, he lands on shore and, and you know, all these people are there and, and he looks at them and goes, hmm. He says, what is wrong with these people? They're like sheep without a shepherd. And then he had compassion on them. See, so when it says Jesus saw them, he did, but he looked at them in love. He looked them through the lens. Church, we've got to look at people through the lens of love. And he spoke words of hope, hope. Going to the priest could only mean one thing. Healing was on the way. Well, in verse number, number 15, one of them, this is to be the one. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back to Jesus shouting, praise God. All ten took off, and as they went, they were healed, and they looked at their, their skin was restored. And they even, I read it again last night how they said that you know, your, you know, digits could fall off because of leprosy. And we assume that since they were healed, they were restored. And when this one guy saw this, now listen, 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 generosity, when he saw the hope of the healer, generosity drove him back. I'm sorry, gratitude drove him back. To Jesus. Do you think, do you suppose that when we love this culture in the name of Jesus, when we speak and see them through the lens of love, that after God does his mighty miracle, that they'll find themselves at the feet of Jesus? Absolutely. This guy, this guy comes back and he couldn't stop praising God. Verse 16, Eli, we're going to skip that quote. Verse 16. So he fell to the ground at Jesus' feet, thanking him for what he had done. And this man was a Samaritan. Of all the ones, it was the enemy, the half-breed, the one that suffered so much racial prejudice and, and, and all of that is the one who came back and fell at the feet of Jesus. Look at our teaching point. You know, compelled by, driven, driven by gratitude, the unlikely does the unlikely. It wasn't the nine Jewish boys who came back to thank the Jew. It was the Samaritan who came back to thank the Jew. In fact, you know, an enemy of the Jews falls at the feet of one and worships him. It's just another example of the power of grace. And mercy. Is it possible that when we show the culture the love of Jesus, would they demonstrate the power of grace and mercy? And the answer is yes. 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 So Jesus asks these questions in verse 17 and 18. 
and, and I call it the, the gratitude test. Jesus asked, did I heal ten men? And the answer is obviously he did. Question two was, where are the other nine? And then lastly, has no one returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? Three piercing questions. You know, if, if he were to, you know, so many of us here today know Jesus, and, and he would ask this, this, our congregation, you know, did I heal 200 people? And the answer would be, yeah, yeah. And then he would ask the question, so how many of us are willing to be the one and be filled with gratitude? In this case, the unlikeliest person. We're all, listen, we're all likely candidates for gratitude. All of us are. We should be willing to fall at the feet of Jesus. You know, the, the teaching point says, you know, says this. Actually, hit Luke 17, 15. Eli, I'm skipping here. Luke 17, 15. This is, there you go. And Jesus said to the man, stand up and go. Your faith has healed thee. After he falls at the feet of Jesus, he says, I want you to stand up and go. Your faith has healed thee. What he wanted to do, he, the man was healed, but Jesus wanted him to know why he was healed. And why he was will, healed was faith in Jesus. When we go out into the culture, we will make sure that people understand we're not the answer. The Southern Baptist Convention is not the answer. The Baptist denomination is not the answer. Dorsville is not the answer. The answer is faith in Jesus Christ. So this month, as we launch this series into, into gratitude, number one, are you willing to find the ones in your world that are broken? Are, are you willing to find the socially invisible? I, 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 I got two minutes. I got to tell a little bit of the story. It was, time gets away from me. Four years ago, five years ago, three years ago, this lady wanders into our office, and she obviously is struggling. We gave her some water and prayed with her and some other things. And Well, it turns out that she was going to be a big part of our lives, but a really big part of one of the members of our church. I don't think you'll mind me saying her name. Her name was Dee Dee Seagraves. And Dee Dee just adopted this lady and gave and gave and gave and gave. To most people, she was socially invisible. But not to Dee Dee. Dee Dee saw through the lens, through the eyes of Jesus. And it changed. So can I challenge us to look through the eyes of love, through the eyes of Jesus? Can I challenge us to find our ten, the ones that everybody else counts as invisible, and make them visible in our world? And can we live this month realizing just how much we have to be thankful for? Would you bow your heads, please? Wow, thank you all so much for listening this morning. And as we talk about, as we think about what we've talked about today, you know, the cross, that Jesus came and died that we could have forgiveness of sins. If you're here today and you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus, my friend Brent is going to be standing down front. And we would love to tell you. I mean, this is what we did all week to, I guess, 800 people. And ask each one of those groups, you know, would you be interested and asking Jesus Christ to come into your life. We ask that question today. And for those of us who already know him, then we have this. Are we willing to see the invisible? Are we willing to be so filled with gratitude that obedience is natural? The altar is going to be open uh, for prayer uh, during our, our closing time here as we sing our last song. If you have any questions or anything we can help you with, any decision we can help you with, you come down and see Brent. Father, thank you very much for your love. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Father, I just love you today. And I thank you for what you want to do. I pray for those who might be struggling in life.
perhaps socially invisible to so many people. And may they know that you see them and you love them. And Father, help us to see the socially invisible. Help us to be so filled with gratitude that it's just natural for us to obey you. We are driven by gratitude to serve you and to love you. So bless this time of decision. And Jesus, I pray it in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand to your feet, please? And Lord, I come and I confess in bowing here I find my rest. And without you I fall apart because you're the one that guides me. And Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. And every hour I need you. My one defense, my right. sin runs deep your grace is more where grace is found is where you are and where you are Lord I am free and holiness is Christ in me Oh, Lord, I need you, oh, I need you, and every hour I need you, my one defense, my righteousness, oh, God, how I need you, so teach my song to me to you. God's people say amen. Let's give the Lord a round of applause. Amen. I went down and talked to my brothers on the front row. And I told them, I said, I'm sorry, but, you know, I couldn't think. And they said, no, no, we're sorry. That's the caliber of men that we have in our youth department. Isn't that awesome? Amen. Come on. That's worth clapping for. Oh, no. Guys, I don't think I've ever done that before in my life. <laughs> That's what I'm going, dude, what was that? <laughs> anyway, I think it's big, maybe it's 68 years old. 
But anyway, I love grace. Amen. All right. Hey, you got anything, bro? Nothing? You ain't got nothing? All right. He said, take one of these boxes and fill it up if you don't have a box yet. Let me lead us in prayer, all right? Father, thank you again for your amazing grace and love. Father, still my heart. Help us to see the invisible. We so often hear words about the homeless situation and all the stuff that goes on in Harrisburg. Father, these people are invisible, but they're not invisible to you. Help them not to be invisible to us. Help us to find ways that we can love and minister in Jesus' name. We pray for that. Father, I thank you for our church family. I thank you for your love and your mercy and your grace. And as Stacy prayed, Father, Satan will probably want to mess with us this week. And I want to pray that we'll have the courage and strength to resist him at all costs. Thank you for these dear people who came today. We love them, Jesus, and we pray it in your precious name. Amen. God bless you guys. Thanks for coming. Uh. <laughs> After a late night. Next year's day, same way. Extra hour sleep. Next year's day, same way. Extra hour sleep. Next year's day, same way. Extra hour sleep.